it's time for another amazing chemistry video with Mr. Stapleton. Proudly sponsored by Farmer Junior Nice Coffee. Hi guys, uh, welcome to the first video which is going to be for uh, the <coughs> final topic of Year 12 Chemistry which is on managing resources, this is topic 4. Um, <coughs> I'm going to be going through, um, this is probably going to be quite a few videos, it's quite a large topic, there are four sections to it. Um, <coughs> I do it slightly different from the Year 12 um, curriculum statement that SACE put out. Um, I put it in I think the order that I think makes most sense as well, so you'll see me jump a little bit as I link things, um, but hopefully it makes sense to you. <coughs> as always, as you're looking through if you do have access to my website and you're using the um, PowerPoint to go along with this as well, um, anytime you see the uh, YouTube uh, symbol, you can click on that and it will take you straight to the YouTube video which explains a bit more about it. Um, if you would like access to my website and all the resources I have for Year 12 Chem, uh, please just uh, leave a comment below and I'm more than happy to uh, give you that information. Okay, so the first part of uh, this topic is all about energy. So we're going to be looking at energy production, we're going to be looking at current trends in energy and also renewable energy as well. So first thing you need to um, know is that energy production, um, there are lots of natural ways that we convert energy. Um, so the main way that we have life on Earth is through the conversion of energy from the sun. So photosynthesis is that um, conversion of energy where we take carbon dioxide from the air with water from the air, uh, so water uh, as a liquid form from rain. Uh, we use sunlight and, and we convert that into carbohydrates, which is what basically is stored energy. Okay, so that takes energy in, all right, so it's an endothermic reaction. And then the um, obviously related reaction to this is the exothermic reaction of respiration. When we breathe out, okay, or we use energy, what happens is that I'm just going to move myself for a little bit. Okay, uh, we take glucose, okay, or carbohydrates from our body. So uh, there's a long process leading through this to where we break them down into what we call uh, simple sugars. Uh, but we take our simple sugars here, we re um, breathe in oxygen from the air, we breathe out carbon dioxide and water vapor. Okay, and this releases energy. So this is an exothermic reaction. Okay, so there's a natural um, synergy between these two. If we look at um, how we have artificially um, started to create energy in the world, uh, we have always done traditionally with the burning of fossil fuels. So, um, you know, back in the you know early caveman times, they would burn uh, trees or logs or things like that for heat. All right, uh, similar sort of thing. All that we're doing is taking dead and decaying plant matter. So here we've got a dead and decaying plant matter here. Okay, what happens is if it gets covered over, okay, it starts to turn into peat. Um, all right. Once it continues to add layer upon layer upon layer, that compresses the dead organic matter, it squeezes out all the liquid. Uh, as it goes down, it obviously increases in temperature as well because of the increased pressure on it. Okay, And that um, eventually gets rid of all the um, liquid within it and it turns into coal. So uh, about here we've got brown coal which still has a little bit of moisture in it and then completely pressurised we get um, black coal continue to pressurize this and we end up with diamonds okay which is basically what they are they're compressed coal to the point where they're um, like incredibly tough and hardened um, <coughs> generally we have anaerobic um, decomposition now, anaerobic means the absence of oxygen okay and that's how we end up with our natural um, hydrocarbons that we end up with uh, for use in either oil or natural gases methane or as uh, pure carbon which is coal so the problem with fossil fuels is that they are actually a finite resource. So what that means is that they actually are being replenished in the earth, but they are not being replenished anywhere near fast enough. We use them much faster than they're currently. We've got dead and decaying plant matter being reformed into um, fossil fuels. And there's currently two uses for them. Traditionally, it just used to be all about um, as fuels uh, to provide energy through um, combustion reactions, but they're also now being used as a feedstock. So what that means is they're being used to produce um, plastics, uh, synthetic polymers, um, and um, the hydrocarbons are really good at giving us polymers which are a wide variety of uses. Uh, however, that will come later on that we'll talk about that. But you need to understand that um, there are some advantages and disadvantages to using them in this way. Uh, when we use them as uh, heat energy, so, so to produce electricity, um, one of the really big advantages is that they are 
relatively abundant, so they're easily found, and um, and they've got a very high energy density. So the chemical energy stored within the bonds of the hydrocarbons, um, there's a lot of energy that's released when you break those bonds. Okay, the good thing is you can also burn them at their point of use. So what that means is that where you need the energy, you can take some fuel there and burn it at that point. You don't have to do it somewhere else and try and transfer the energy over. And also, um, obviously one of the other main benefits is there's lots of infrastructure already in place. What that means is we've been burning fossil fuels for a very long time, so we've got a lot of um, you know, factories and power lines and everything like that connected to them uh, to use our fossil fuels really well. We've developed the internal combustion engine really well now for about 170 years, okay, and that has um, allowed us to uh, really develop something which is uh, becoming quite... Um, efficient in some ways and inefficient in other ways, but we've, we've been able to do quite a lot with it. The downside, obviously, is that it's a finite resource. Uh, massive contributors to greenhouse effect when we um, burn the fossil fuels with these large amounts of carbon dioxide. Uh, if we have incomplete combustion, which happens quite often when we don't have enough oxygen for the burning of our fossil fuel, we get uh, dangerous products, more on that in a minute. And uh, the high temperature can lead to uh, the formation of oxides of nitrogen. So when you see this here, which says NOxes, that means oxides of nitrogen. And hopefully you remember that from the first topic, where um, lightning strikes or um, combustion engines produce high amount of energy, which breaks the nitrogen triple bond, uh, and that can contribute to photochemical smog and acid rain. In terms of as a feedstock, um, so to make plastics, again they're readily available, allows a wide variety of plastics to be made. Uh, the downside of using them to make uh, plastics is that you can't use them as a fossil fuel, which they're quite good for being used for, and of course they're non-renewable and finite. So what we've uh, started spending a lot of time on uh, as scientists is looking to renewable energy sources. So these are sources of energy where we can replenish. Um, the um, energy that we're using and um, it, the replenishment matches the rate at which we're using it. So obviously here you can see a wind farm, South Australia has the highest um, capacity of wind farms in all of Australia. We actually have the highest per capita um, amount of uh, natural or renewable energy sources of any state in, in Australia, which is really good. Um, and that obviously is being a big push by the government to reduce our reliance upon all of our energy that comes currently from uh, Victoria, and in particular like um, the natural gas and coal fields over there. Uh, I think it's called the Trobe Valley, where they, uh, most of it comes from in Victoria. So the current energy ones that we're really looking at, solar and wind energy, you're probably familiar with, but bioethanol and biodiesel um, have started coming out as uh, additives at the moment for um, fossil fuels, uh, and so petrol. Uh, so currently if you go to a petrol station, uh, there's a number of different options of petrol you can put in. Uh, your regular unleaded is like your E95, then you've got the E90 or E10, uh, sorry, regular petrol is like a 95, then you've got the E10 which means there's 10% ethanol in there and then you've got like your high performance one in there as well. And we've also got biodiesel which is a replacement for traditional hydrocarbon diesel um, as a way of maybe producing fuels we don't have to rely on fossil fuels for. So I'm going to look at bioethanol firstly. Bioethanol is a biofuel Okay, that is produced through the fermentation of sugars. So um, it's exactly the same process that we kind of go through to produce alcohol. Okay, so if um, you're looking at the organic um, section and you're looking at alcohols, um, this is the same process where you take a, in this case, we originally start with starch, which is a complex carbohydrate. We hydrolyze that, and hydrolyzing is just simply adding water in. So we add water to the starch, we break that down to a um, disaccharide such as sucrose. Okay, we hydrolyze it again with more water, and we produce these what we call simple sugars or monosaccharides. Okay. You notice that fructose and glucose have exactly the same formulas. Okay, They are different structures. So glucose has an aldehyde group, fructose has a ketone group, and um, basically they're what we call structural isomers. Same um, chemical formula, but different structure. Um, what happens is that this mixture is catalyzed by zymase, which is an enzyme, so a biological catalyst, um, to produce ethanol here. And we do produce carbon dioxide as well. So the production of this does produce some carbon dioxide, however there is a benefit in terms of producing um, bioethanol, I'll talk about that in a minute. What we need to do is take that mixture of um, uh, ethanol um, in the aqueous solution and um, it's about 14% ethanol uh, in there because at any higher concentration uh, the enzymes uh, die off, they're denatured, um, so they don't 
I shouldn't say die off, they're denatured and so they don't actually catalyse the reaction anymore. Um, and so what happens is we distill it to produce um, more uh, pure bioethanol and then when you combust it, okay here, here's a combustion reaction of ethanol, um, we can produce energy and again release carbon dioxide and water vapour. Okay. Now the major source for the sugars that produce bioethanol is actually corn at the moment. Uh, okay, uh, corn is really good at um, producing the um, the starch, the carbohydrates that we need to be able to do that fermentation. Uh, sorry, that hydrolysis to be able to get uh, ethanol through fermentation. Now, this you may look at this and go, okay, so uh, we produce carbon dioxide through um, making the ethanol back here. So we're producing carbon dioxide, and when we burn it, we're producing carbon dioxide as well. So obviously, yes, we do, but the major benefit of using um, a biofuel such as bioethanol is the fact that because we're producing it from corn, as the corn is growing, what's it doing? It's photosynthesizing. It's absorbing carbon dioxide from the air. So we're trying to go towards this whole concept of carbon neutral. Okay, so the idea is that as we grow the corn, as we grow um, the plants that we get the fuel from, Okay, uh, what happens is that the, um, the corn, the, um, the plants absorb carbon dioxide from the air and that um, is then eventually will be released again but it's then absorbed as we grow new crops. Okay. The downside of that is corn is obviously used as a major food source. Right? It's used to produce a lot of food and in the world currently we do have um, an inadequacy to provide food equally around the world and if we're taking what's called arable land, that's land where we grow crops um, <coughs> and food, if we're taking that and instead deciding to use it to create a um, fuel source, we're obviously going to be increasing the effect of uh, food shortage around the world. So <coughs> there's some ethical issues around that at the moment and uh, ways that they're trying to look at um, producing the ethanol without impacting on food production as well. So the real major benefit is that you um, <coughs> remove CO2 from the atmosphere as the um, corn or the plant is growing. Okay. The real downside is that you can't use it as a food source. Now biodiesel on the other hand is a um, little bit different. We still make it from plants um, but it's a long chain ester. So uh, if you've had a look at the um, organic section again you're probably a bit familiar with esters and if you in particular have a look at um, oh, I've got a mental blank sorry I'll remember it in a minute um, but basically where you take um, fatty acids so long carbon chain um, carboxylic acids triglycerides thank you triglycerides uh, and you react to that um, with an alcohol or here you can get a um, uh, so in triglycerides we took propane-123-triol and we reacted that with a fatty acid to get a um, triglyceride. Okay, in this case what we're doing is we're just reacting with a single um, alcohol, in this case ethanol, uh, from the soybean canola oil here. So this is the canola oil, long chain carboxylic acid. The carboxylic acid and the alcohol react to form the ester group, which is this one here. And this is the replacement for biodiesel. Okay, so a, um, a previous version of biodiesel um, was yeah around about you know 16, 17 carbon atoms long. Okay, um, and it produced a lot of energy, so it allowed um, engines to be more powerful. That's why the um, diesel engines are normally in trucks um, and buses. Um, but obviously, you get um, a greater chance of incomplete combustion with the longer the carbon chain is, um, and so the um, replacing it with a biodiesel is um, more beneficial uh, because you're going to again remove the CO2 from the atmosphere as the um, plant grows so it's quite quite useful. All right what I'm going to do is stop this first one here um, because I don't want to go on for too long there's uh, plenty of stuff to go through and have a look at here. What I'm going to do with the next one is to just finish off this topic by looking at uh, solar power, wind power and a couple of the other renewable energy sources. Thanks guys.